And soon after that, I was asked to go and understudy him in the vortex. And I played in it for several weeks because he left. And he was very kind to me, but I was greatly in awe of him. And he was, of course, frightfully smart with dressing gowns in the wardrobe and uh, sort of um, sudden huge success as the wicked young man of the moment. With the success came a lot of pleasurable trappings. New suits, a car, silk shirts, an extravagant amount of dressing gowns and pyjamas and a still more extravagant amount of publicity. I was photographed, interviewed, photographed again. And on one occasion, sitting up in an over-elaborate bed, looking like a heavily doped Chinese illusionist. I've always felt that this photograph caused me a great deal of harm. Anyone looking at it could tell at a glance, with a certain justification, that I was a weedy sensualist in the last stages of physical and moral degeneration. In fact, this degenerate soon monopolised British theatre. In 1925, he had four plays running simultaneously in the West End, and he owned his first Rolls Royce at 26. Coward had created a style of theatre that was entirely his own. He did invent himself. He was a... You know, there was nobody... I think Kenneth Tynan said, in years to come, if people say he was a coward sort of person, everyone would know what they meant um, years afterwards. And he did invent himself and also a kind of, of, of I don't know, morality and style, which was entirely his own and nobody else's, and owed nothing to anybody else either. In the eight years from 1924 to 32, he consolidated his style with plays like Hay Fever, Bittersweet, Private Lives and Design for Living. Coward starred in all of them. In Design for Living, he played a part that the public were meant to think was just like him, a successful young playwright with no time for conventional middle-class life. It's a knockout. It's magnificent. It'll run a year. Two years. Three years. Four years, five years, six years. It'll run forever. Old ladies will be trampled to death, struggling to get into the pit. Women will have babies regularly in the upper circle bar during the big scene at the end of the second act. Regularly as clockwork. Daily Mail says it's daring and dramatic and witty. The Daily Express says it's disgusting. Oh, I should be cut to the quick if it's in anything else. The Daily Mirror, I regret to say, is a trifle carping. Getting uppish, I see, not a little thing. Change and decay is gripping throughout. The characterization falters here and there, but the dialogue is polished and sustains a high level from first to last and is frequently witty, nay, even brilliant. Oh, I love nay. But, here we go, dear, but the play on the whole is decidedly thin. My God, they've noticed it. Thin? Thin? What do they mean, thin? Just thin, darling. Thin's thin the whole world over. You can't get away from it. Would you call it thin? Emaciated. I shall write fat plays from now onwards. Fat plays filled with very fat people. It ought to be self-evident, but it, it often isn't about people. What made Noel formidable was that he had this terrific self-conviction. Conviction of his own talent. He always used to say, I'm richly gifted, and at lunch that I was at, even uh, richly gifted and highly talented, that was the phrase he used. Um, it didn't seem arrogant either with him, but uh, he said it an awful lot. Coward was really the first great English performer to live in the what we would see as modern celebrity. He, he said that he was the Beatles of his era, and he wasn't wrong. He was a phenomenon. Uh, Destiny's taught. And uh, in that sense, he really for the 20th century caught the momentum uh, of modern celebrity and and lived it in 1926 he bought Goldenhurst a large retreat in Kent where within a few weeks he was recovering from a nervous breakdown why shouldn't he but his main pleasure was to hold court and invite friends from the world of theatre and the arts to stay with him for the weekend. It was a great treat to be asked to Goldenhurst. We used to go for weekends, be driven down a great big American car. And um, it, was, it was a fantastic weekend. It was no use to 
So I'd get the Sunday papers and stay in bed and smoke 55 cigarettes. And that two hours in the morning was a joy. I mean, he was really marvellously funny. So I always remember him as a really terrific host. I think he preferred having a little bunch of actors there than anybody, you know. And the silk dressing gown and the cigarette holder. I mean, no, that was the image, but no, it was carpet slippers, really, and steak and kidney pie and baked beans. You know, he ate the most filthy food. You know, he didn't like caviar or anything like that. He loved sausages and mash and baked beans and all the wrong things. And ate it constantly. Goldenhurst was where he was able to be himself, away from the press and photographers. His personal life had to be kept private. He was homosexual, which was against the law until the 1960s. His first long relationship was with Jack Wilson, an American stockbroker, who was soon installed producing Coward's plays. To those who knew him, Coward made no secret of his sexual orientation. <laughs> I was about 18 and he, he rang me up. And he said, um, I think it's time you came round for a sex lecture. And uh, I thought to myself, well, my sex is all right. I don't think I really need an awful lot of help from Noel. But anyway, uh, lunch with Noel, you don't turn that down. I said, oh, what a great idea. So round I went, one o'clock, and he came down after five or ten minutes, and Coley, the secretary, uh, brought in uh, bacon and eggs. We had a, I was there for about three hours. We didn't discuss anything to do with my sex life, but um, I did hear a great deal about it. <laughs> And he was, I must say, he was very disarming because he was, he was very open a, a, about it. I mean, it was quite plain that men were, were his thing. That's it. But I think he, that he did, um, he said, I've done everything from soup to nuts and I've ended up with men and that's it. In certain times, though, uh, he must have been approached by people saying, look, it really would be better, Noel, if you married Joyce Carey or, you know, you, we, we publicised your relationship with Gertrude Lawrence as being a sexual one, which which it wasn't. As far as anyone I know who knew Cad knows or can say, he never had a sexual relation with, sh relationship with a woman. Um, there was none of that pretense. People had often suspected that Coward and Gertrude Lawrence were lovers. They were great friends from childhood and on stage formed the most effective and popular partnership that Coward ever shared. Gertrude Lawrence, at her best, and with me, she was usually at her best, was the most brilliant comedian to play with. She was so swift and her eyes were so true. And it was an enchantment to work with her. She had this shimmering kind of sexual, sensuous elegance, like a perfume wafting over you. It was just terrific, terrific. And I saw absolutely then why no adored her. I mean, they were oil and water because Noel was disciplinarian to the point of, uh, of mania. And she was the opposite. Instinctive, would be giving terrible performances if an affair she had had fallen flat at 12 noon, she had a matinee to do. She would play the whole thing in a state of complete shock without being able to, and it would absolutely, it would enrage Noel. He would walk off the stage in the interval and berate her. And they went, they had terrific rows. I'd always wanted to play a right play for Gertie. Her contract with Charlotte was up. And so she sent me a telegram saying, contract Charlotte up, what about it, or something. And I wrote Private Lives in, in Shanghai in the Cathay Hotel very quickly and posted it back. And um, had a telegram back saying red script nothing wrong that can't be fixed so I went back the only thing's going to be fixed is your performance what are you doing here private lives which he wrote in 1930 is the epitome of coward's comic style a few minutes of it survive on a recording he made the same year with Gertrude Lawrence 